Yes, yes, yes. What is up? What is up? MCR family, another weekly edition of the show live on YouTube, Twitch, and Twitter. Should be a fun show today. We have Mark Breland, Dante Wilder, topic to get into. I so wish Rob could have jumped on the show just for that topic alone, to be honest. Like, that's all I needed Rob to be on, just to laugh about that shit. Uh, obviously, we have Daniel Kinahan update since he has responded to the allegations finally with a public statement that he sent to basically every boxing and mainstream website that he can. Obviously, a massive amount of fights this weekend to break down and preview. Fury Joshua arguing over whose name is first. A lot to get into on today's show, ladies and gentlemen. So hit the like button, share the show, subscribe. And I'm Matthew Hunter. Find me right there on all social media platforms. I'm joined by the one and only Gary in Dallas. Gary, how are you, man? You're muted on StreamYard. It's okay, man. It happens. Two for two today. <laughs> it did literally five minutes ago. <laughs> um, I'm good. It's got finally a big boxing. It's a huge, busy, busy weekend with good fights, including Castano, who is criminally underrated against Teixeira. Um, it was also pretty good, uh, but uh, Castano should win that fight. Um, Rob was supposed to join us. Apparently, he's doing his kids' homework or something at 11 o'clock at night. That I don't happens. know. That happens. Don't say that doesn't happen, man. That happened. happened to me. I just didn't do my homework. Like I wasn't that really like I would just talk to my teacher and like Fidesz, like just give me like an extra week to do it. Like it's not a big deal. Like you're lucky. And then like in high school, I know his kid's not in high school yet, but like in high school, I would just have the coach, the baseball coach talk to my teachers. Like, I don't really have time for that. Like just like first up, before you continue, thank you, Santiago. I, which I, I honestly believe was a typo or like you messed up. You didn't mean to donate that much. <laughs> but thank you. If, you thank did, you. if it's a typo, you can personal message me. I can send you the money back. It's no issue. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, or add a few more zeros on me. Either way. We, we... <laughs> yeah, but collectively we can all do that, right? Yeah. Everyone send $500. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, please. That'd be awesome. Um, there's a lot to talk about on today's show. And I actually have a hard out, ladies and gentlemen. So I unfortunately have to leave at a certain point because I have another show I'm recording uh, at 4 p.m. with the Walkout Network with Anthony Walker, Jay Patry, and Benjamin Duffy, obviously previewing the upcoming UFC pay-per-view. Um, so unfortunately, I will have to get out of here uh, at some point. So without further ado, let's get into the topics. Um, and there, we have to start the show with at least mentioning it. It's a p- sad news. In the boxing world, I feel like we've lost a lot of people in the last 12 months or so due to COVID or not due to COVID, you know, just due to age and um, disease and such. And that's another case we have here with Leon Spinks passing away at 67 years old after a battle with cancer. Um, obviously, rest in peace to Leon Spinks. Condolences to his family and loved one and his fans. Um, another loss for the boxing community. And I know um, we, not to point any fingers at anyone on the show, but we, often, you know, made light of Leon Spinks' win over Muhammad Ali and such. And I think the community as a whole has done that. Um, but Leon Spinks was also a guy that came in with under, what, 15 wins? and of fights or something like that. Yeah, yeah. And, and beat Muhammad Ali. So, I mean, whatever we can say about him, he is still someone that beat Muhammad Ali. So, I bet he never really gave a damn about any of our stupid opinions. Um, but again, rest in peace, rest in power to Leon Spinks. Gary, any sort of brief thoughts on the passing of... Yeah. And he's a gold medalist, and we did that. You know, like, I make fun of him because he lost to a guy that was 2-34. and 34. But, like, he beat Muhammad Ali. He was heavyweight champion of the world. Not too many people can make that claim, right, in the history of the world. Um, he's one of them. So, good for him. And uh, rest in peace, champ. Yeah, rest in peace. And just, man, we've lost a lot of people. Um, Patrick Connor over at uh, Box History, right, and uh, Knuckles and Gloves, I think is his podcast, right, that he does. Um, he had a huge long Twitter thread on all the people that we've lost due to COVID and just in, in the last year. I really recommend people to go do this, especially for some of those like real purist heads out there that listen to this show. You, you guys are going to recognize more names than I did. Uh, and I, it was a long list, unfortunately. And I think that we should just, as a community, honor those that you know obviously came before us. Trying to move away from that very somber, sad topic, let's get into the shenanigans, the drama the beef, the feud between Deontay Wilder 
and his former trainer, Mark Breland. And Gary, I got to say, obviously, this isn't like too shocking. All that's come out from Breland basically saying that Wilder's career is over and said that he, you know, awful to train with. It just, I mean, a litany of things came out. I mean, it was a, um, like the dams had burst in terms of information from Mark Breland when he had obviously been very quiet with all the allegations, all the accusations, all the, the shade from Deontay Wilder in the past you know, year or so, right? Gary, I mean, I, before I give like my thoughts on, I want to give your thoughts on this because we really haven't talked about this like in the group chat. So I really don't know like how you guys are viewing this story and viewing this feud, this beef, whatever we want to call it between Mark Breland and now Deontay Wilder. Um, but I was surprised when you said that JD's was not just the head trainer in title that he was actually the head trainer right like that he he called the shots i was surprised by that and uh Breland kind of said that and he doesn't know anything about boxing like he could have put a cast uh, fury could have wrapped his head with a cast and jd's wouldn't have known that's how little he knows about boxing right like and i kind of thought that like okay they have a relationship while they these have a relationship so that'll be his head trainer but in reality Right? It was like when Joe Paterno was 100 years old and still head coach of Penn State. He's not really the head coach, right? Like, the, the coordinators. I thought it was like that, but no, you, you were like, no, he's he's the head trainer in there. Um, I, I I think, <clears throat> look, I don't know, and you would know better. Are any of these things true? Does he not hit a speed bag? Does he not hit a heavy bag? Does he not jump rope? I don't know. It seems impossible, but he doesn't do road work, which he says he swims which is something people used to do back in the day when they got older because your, your knees start to wear. I don't know if that's true. Um, <laughs> I, I'm pretty sure I've talked about this before. Um, I mean, I've been, I've been in a few Wilder camps, right, back in the day, right, well, name redacted. Uh, haven't been in some time, so obviously things could have shifted for the Wilder, uh, for the Fury camps, right? So, like, maybe my, my information's outdated. That's possible. Leaving that caveat there, right? Um, but most of the accusations in terms of Deontay Wilder's lack of training seem to be accurate for Mark Breland, to be quite honest. I mean, from my experience, if we wanted to get him to hit the bag and have any footage of that, we had to request it. He wouldn't do it on his own. Like, we never saw him hit a heavy bag, hit a double end bag. Um, speed bag. I mean, I I never really saw him do any of that unless one of us asked him to do it, and that was only one time that one of us asked him to do it, and he hit the heavy bag a couple times. Like that was it. Okay, he did hit mitts a little bit, but only with Breland, pretty much. He did hit mitts a couple times with JDs, but it wasn't that great, to be honest. Like Mark Breland was the better mitt work coach, obviously speaking. Um, but that was limited. It was predominantly, from what I saw, sparring centric. He went in there and sparred twelve to sixteen rounds, and then he would leave. Come in, stretch, do a little bit, you know, of shadow boxing, maybe do some mitt work, and then twelve to sixteen rounds of sparring, he's out. Okay, that was kind of the gist. Now he always told us he did do strength and conditioning. We just were never allowed, or never were offered how do you want to frame it, to see that. That's weird, right? Because I've talked to a lot of fighters, and they'll always let you watch them work out. Sparring sometimes, they're fine with it, but their trainers and coaches, like, we don't really want you to do that. Like, depending on where they are in camp, right? Like, if it, if it's, like, they're just sparring, like, it's sparring day, okay, fine, you can watch it. But if it's, like, two weeks out from the fight, we don't really want you here. Like, no, they had an open gym policy for sparring. You can come in and any, fight? anyone. Anyone off the streets could come in and watch. I mean, that's awesome, but it's a little weird. But then you can't watch them with weights. Like the that's only, the only the only rule you just couldn't film it, of course. Right, right, right. Very obvious one, right? Um, but yeah, I mean, there was it was very normal for like fans of his like come into town and like want to see Deontay Wilder train, and they were allowed to be in the gym. They got to meet him and take pictures with him. Like it was very open in that way. But his training regimen was very limited, from what I saw. And again, that's only from what I saw. Again, I'm not the, I wasn't there for everything. wasn't there for every fight. I was only there for two or three fights. 
but they were some of them were big like one of them or two of them were the Luis Ortiz fights so like I saw some of his big fights and his big preparations for those fights and it was limited of course like that's just what it was and you know I on like a human level right like uh, taking away like the, the whether or not Wilder trains accurately like tabling that for a second right like on the human level between Breland and Wilder Wilder has drugged Breland through the mud for a long time. I'm actually shocked it took Breland this long to do it. Um, and respect to him for having the patience to take this long to respond. Um, and I don't... I'll, the only thing I'm not shocked at is like the tone of this response. This is very Breland-esque. Like, half of it he doesn't really give a fuck about. Right? Like, some of the questions you see, like, uh, in the interview, like it was about like the Fury and Wilder fight. Like, was he th- think about that? Is it going to happen? Like, I don't care. We don't don't give I don't give a fuck about that. Like, that's one hundred percent Breland. So, like on a human level, like I I understand Breland here. I understand his frustration, and I think he's completely uh, in his right to say what he said. Yeah, Breland's a New Yorker. I mean, I'm surprised he bit his tongue as long as he did. <laughs> Honestly, um, look. They made horrible claims about him, right? Like they said, like he put muscle relaxant in his uh, water. Like these are crimes. They're, you know what I'm saying? Like they, they say he drugged him before a fight, which I don't know. I, I attempted murder. I don't know. Like, but like that's a horrible claim, which is obviously not true, right? Um, I mean, it's not like Wallace said, "Oh, I just wish he hadn't stopped the fight. I think he stopped it too soon. I still had plenty left in the tank." He made horrible claims about him, saying he cheated. Um, to, to, to damage his career and damage his health. I mean, that's not cool what Wilder did. And I get Wilder was hurting because he took a loss, right? His ego is more hurt than anything. Um, but look, Breland did the only thing he could do, right? Like, I was saying the round before he should probably stop this fight. No one objectively watching the fight thought that fight should go any longer. So Breland did his responsibility. JD's was going to let him get it, go in there and get his ass kicked and maybe get permanently hurt because that's his cash cow. Breland did the right thing, and Walla didn't appreciate it. Okay, then you fire me. Then we're, then we're done, right? Like, if you can't live with that, then we're done. I, I would do it again if I had to. Um, and and also, like, <laughs> fighters tra- changing camps, changing trainers, one is not uncommon, period, and definitely not uncommon after big losses. It's right. not. It's so, like, that. That's that's normal. Like, Wilder was completely in his right to fire Breland if he wanted to, be upset with the stoppage if he wanted to, but the accusations of cheating, like, and almost like criminality on Breland's part, it's just, it makes no sense to me. And again, that's why it's so shocking that Breland took this long to respond because those types of accusations end careers. And even he talked about that. Like, Breland, in part of the interview, talks about how, like, like, Wilder's career is over, but so is mine. So it doesn't really matter. And it's like really sad. Like he even thinks like I'm done. Like I'm over it. But is he done? Like, I'm saying is that a personal choice by him? Like I'm done with Wilder. I'm done with boxing at this point. Like that's it. Like I'm done. Not like no one will ever hire me again because I think he did a pretty good job. I don't think it matters per se. Yeah. Because it, it the effect is the same, right? The result is the same. Whether the accusations lead to like all the fighters like not wanting to hire Breland or Breland becoming so like disgusted with the sport in a sense or like the business that because of the accusations that he doesn't want to train anymore either way the result is him no longer wanting to be in the sport and him thinking his career is over like that's sad like that's deeply depressing on a way i heard Breland's massively rich though like he owns real estate in new york city really yeah <laughs> are you gonna be just fine yeah <laughs> Breland was always a super cool guy but you can tell that he was always the odd man out in that camp. Yeah, it's like Jacques Vaughn with the Nets, right? He's a defensive guy, right? He played for Popovich and Doc Rivers, right? And now he's on this net team that doesn't play like a defense. Like, why am I really here? Like, you got Steve Nash and, and, and Kyrie Irving and Mike D'Antoni. Why am I here? Like, no one's going to listen to me. Like, I might as well just leave, right? Like, I, that's kind of like Mark Real's like, I'm a boxing guy in a room full of non boxers, and they won't listen to me. Why am I here? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> there was numerous times where, like, it was odd to me how often Breland would be, like, in the office in the gym and not be outside, like, watching Wilder train. And, like, 
I never really put like again because I'm trying to get. I was there working, so I'm trying to get footage. Like I'm, that's what I'm focused on. In hindsight, you start thinking like, why? Why wasn't there a lot of communication between JDs and Mark Breland? Like, why did it always seem like they were on completely different pages? They were never really working together in any aspect, and then they had to come together to work when Wilder was fighting or he was sparring, right? But other than that, like they they were never sitting around talking, socializing. Even Breland and Wilder, like I never really saw them just sitting around socializing. Like that wasn't a thing. You know, him and JDs, they have a great relationship. Wilder and JDs, like they've been like that was the first coach Wilder had. Uh, you bring in Breland because it's obvious fit, right? Breland was a welterweight you. He was a six foot one welterweight, you know, who was like long and lanky. It's like, oh, it just makes perfect sense why you'd bring him in, but then why don't you listen to him? You know, that's what's so weird to me. I think Breland didn't improve his game because I'll be honest, like I saw it. Like I saw the work that Breland did on the mitts with Wilder and how much better Wilder looked after that when he was sparring versus the times he sparred not doing that mitt work. You know what I mean? Like, just in terms of, like, getting you, like, sharp enough, like, that little extra edge. And, like you said, Breland, in terms of style, his own fighting style, his own training style, I think it complemented Wilder's very well. But, you know, there was a issue of leadership, I'm assuming. You know, who's in charge here? You know, I think that was an issue. I think Breland probably wanted to have some sort of authority and, you know, strategy and tactics, and he wasn't allowed to, to some degree, because JD's was the lead trainer, and that's what Wilder wanted. You know, it's just a shit show situation. And, you know, I, I've seen a, you know, when I say I've seen, I've only seen like secondhand. Like I've had people tell me that like the wilder sphere in terms of like YouTube shows, podcasters, media people, fans that are wilder fans freaking out and trying to like attack Breland. I think those people are completely out of pocket. And like they clearly have no idea what the fuck they're talking about, especially those that have the same firsthand experience that I'm talking about. Right. And it's really interesting to see that that sphere of the box community try to circle the wagons around this drama. When we all know who's the odd man out here in terms of saying the crazy shit, like who's the one out here saying the wild shit that is pointing fingers at everyone else with wild accusations that we all don't believe. Like, we don't need to defend that. Like, we don't. Like, I'm a guy that has sat here on this show and, like, defended Wilder quite a bit compared to, like, you and Rob, right? And oh. especially Fu. Why does Fu hate him so much? We'll get to that later. Because he wants to, like, suck up to the UK fans, okay? That's that's why. Fu wants to suck up to Rob. Um, but I think I've been pretty consistent that, like, throughout this entire fallout, of the wilder excuses and accusations and allegations as they as they gotten more crazy clearly is a massive red flag is a massive concern going forward i'm not going to go as far as breland and say that wilder's career is over because of it or over because of x y and z and that's a little bit hyperbolic the guy's like 33 years old and it's a heavyweight division for fuck's sake but hopefully wilder can get his shit together because like none of this helps him like even from like a focus standpoint like how can you go and focus for a camp while all this shit is going on you just it's impossible let alone the business side let alone all these other aspects to it you just can't do it um gary any other thoughts on this before we move on no no um i yeah as one thing his career is, is over it depends no his career's not over he'll, next fight he'll make he'll make millions right i'm gonna win that fight and then he'll make 10 million to fight one of the heavyweight champs. Now, if you say his career as a heavyweight champ is over, I still don't agree with that. He could beat anyone in that division with that power. I wouldn't pick him necessarily, mm -hmm. but it's not out of the realm of possibility, right? Like, yeah, he could knock out Anthony Joshua. As a matter of fact, I would pick that. He could knock out Fury. He almost did it. Fury needed to get up like the, like the Phoenix from the dead, right? Like, he could knock out Usyk. Usyk's been clipped. Like, I'm not picking that to happen. I'm not picking him to beat Fury. But these things aren't out of the realm of possibilities. But, like, do I think he becomes heavyweight champion again? Probably not. But there's certainly a reasonable chance that he does. Um, For Ben Media in the chat, a.k.a. Lazy Lefty on Twitter. Shout out to you. 
good friend of the show. I'm um, saying Wilder's wrong, and so is Breland. Ain't neither uh, is innocent. Oh, I just lost it. Here we go. Where is it at? There it is. Uh, so I'm trying to act like Breland is a saint. He ain't. I'm curious, um, Lazy Lefty, like, what do you mean by that? Like, how do you see Breland as being wrong here, other than, like, the hyperbolic statement of, like, saying that Wilder's career is over? Like, that's that's rude, I guess. But, like, <laughs> I mean, what Wilder has accused him of is not rude. It's far more um, malicious in my mind. So, like, I, I want to understand how you view Breland in this situation. I've seen you in our group chat, Lazy Lefty, and other places talk about this, and I just don't understand your perspective. So I would love to understand it more. Um, Daniel Edwards, I need to hear Matt get into uh, the Kinahan response. God, I guess we can get into it right now. Gary, did you read the Kinahan response? I did. You did? You read the whole thing? Uh, I read what was in the, yeah, what was in the article that you sent. That, that's all I read. Was there more to it? No, 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 no. Okay. I just didn't read the whole thing. <laughs> or like half of it, I'm like, I don't need to read this. Like, this is bullshit. Um, but Gary, obviously, Daniel Canahan has, has responded to the accusations and allegations uh, of being the criminal mastermind, so to speak, in the boxing management industry. Um, and obviously, partaking in a massive cartel that's been linked to a dozen plus murders, give or take. The response has been, uh, and by the way, before I get into the response, because this came after this specific news as well, that one of the BBC journalists that was involved in the documentary was warned of a threat to their life has been put basically in like protective custody in a sense as a result. Um, the response from Kinahan has been that he has helped boxing out a lot, basically, that he has uh, been a part of massive fights, that he loves the sport, that he comes from the same place as these fighters, and he wants to, like, protect them, and he loves journalism. Like, that's the gist. Like, that's kind of the talking points, I would say, of the response. I'm not going to actually read it out. I mean, it, it, you can read on any boxing website right now if you actually want to find it. Uh, I'm not going to give him that sort of shine. But Gary, um, your thoughts on this? Uh, on Kinahan's response? I mean, what's he going to say? Yeah, I'm part of a criminal. I'm the head. I'm the capo. I don't know what they call it. You got, me. You got me, guys. You got me. You got me. You got me. <laughs> Obviously, it's me. It's my dad before me. It's a family thing. I mean... It's all kind of comical, but it all goes down the same path of every other organized crime. Now, if they were Italians, they'd have the FBI all over them, but they're not, so they're fine. I guess I don't know how. What is the? I don't. What is the? Is there an EU version? Oh, oh wait, I guess not the EU anymore. Um, no, is there, it's, no, it's Ireland. Ireland's not the UK. Ireland, so, okay, so the what UK, is Northern Ireland is part of the UK. The Republic of Ireland is not part of the UK. I don't understand that part of the globe at all. Um, I just don't. Um, It'd be like if Canada... This is a very bad example, okay? Imagine if we gave North Dakota to Canada, but they kept calling it North Dakota. Do you get what I'm saying, kind of? Yeah. That's kind of what happened, but like more religious you know, factors were involved there, and you know, terrorism and shit. But, all yeah. right, so like the Irish Red Army. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, what was I saying? Okay. Uh, uh, I don't know either. In a hand. Uh, I've I mean, about the FBI or the equivalent. Oh, yeah. If he, if he was an Italian, they'd have the FBI all over him. You know what the FBI stands for, right? Forever bothering Italians. What is the... FBI equivalent. I'm sure there's a there's a federal police force in Ireland, right? Like that does in federal crimes. The Guardi or Guardi or Guardi. I don't know how it's pronounced. I think it's Guardi. G A R D I. I think it's the spelling of it. Okay. If it was Guido and the boys, they'd have problems, right? Well, I don't think they really have any <laughs> Italian, uh... Wales. They do. A lot of them move to Wales. Really. I mean, not like New York City or anything, like that, but yeah, this is this is definitely an Italian population in Wales. Because uh, oh, you know, it, it was a, a mess there, like in the fifties and sixties and stuff. A lot of people moved out. Mm -hmm. 
on elsewhere. Argentina had more Italians in it than America did up until like the 70s when Argentina kind of crashed. And then those Argentinians moved either back to Italy or to America. Yep, yep. Um, yes, uh, sorry, it's, there's an A before the I. My, my apologies. Uh, Harpo Marx, one of the greatest comedians of all time, apparently watching our show from the grave. Hey! <laughs> Guardians of the National Police Force. Yes, that is who they are. Bama Boy with the super chat. Thank you. Saying, I watched Tina Harrell. I was like, God damn, I should look at the super chat first. Ah, oh. <laughs> he's, he's a good basic fighter, in my opinion, similar to Angelo Leo as far as talent goes. I take Nakatani over him. Whack. That would be a good fight. Oh, I do like Nakatani. Let's see it. Let's That'd be see good it. Fight. It is. I like Nakatani. He's good. He's a giant, man. That motherfucker's like 6'2". At, all, all like way. Stylistically, for a pure boxer like that, because he's going to... He's got to get in and out, in and out constantly. He's going to lose the bottom. It's a tough fight. That's a tough fight for Tom Howard. Tom Howard would figure it out. He's that good. Uh, and Matthew D'Souza in the chat, uh, thank you for bringing us back home to Kinahan, because we got off the subject there, saying there's a reason Kinahan is based in Dubai and will answer where MTK money comes from. Yes, so they can avoid the law enforcement in Ireland and obviously the... EU as well, so like Interpol, stuff like that, as well as things for international agencies. Um, you know, the UAE is, doesn't really give a fuck about the Guardi or Interpol that much. Let's be honest. They have slave labor. They don't give a fuck about European <laughs> law enforcement agencies. Um, so, back to, like, his response, I think it's just all bullshit. Like, I, I'm not, like, I don't know what the deep dive there is to have about it. Daniel Edwards, you know, earlier wanted my response on it. I'm sorry if I disappointed you. Like I, uh, it's just all bullshit. Like that's what it is. Like sorry. Like when you have this many agencies pointing the fingers at you, when you have not only that, but like the public knowledge, right? Like if ever if the if the common person, so to speak, in the UK and Ireland was like, no man, Daniel Cannon is not like that at all. Like they're not like this. They're just like community activists. Like they, you know, some other shit, right? Maybe we can push back on the state authorities, right? There's an argument there. Trust, trust me, as a communist, I can definitely follow that line. And, but we don't have that here. The only people that are actually defending the Kinahan cartel are the boxers that he advises and that he helps basically get checks for. Like, that's the only people we see defending Kinahan are the people that are in business with him, in bed with him. Everyone else. Every layperson is out there going, no, this motherfucker is dirty as fuck. And then they keep their mouth shut, you know? Like, he's not bothering you. Just keep your mouth shut, okay? You know? <laughs> Just let him do his own devices, okay? <laughs> Look, I, all of you fighters out there that are being advised by Kinahan, stop making public statements on this, okay? It is better for you all just to avoid it and to ignore the backlash and in two weeks' time, it's the box community. Most of us will probably forget, unfortunately. You know what I mean? Like you might lose a sponsor or two. But again, in two weeks' time, you're going to pick up another sponsor. It's going to be okay. Stop making public statements about it. You're, going to, you're making so much worse on yourself. Blazio Saunders, Amir Khan, anyone. Anyone affiliated with MTK. Gary, any other thoughts? No, no, that's it. I wonder what Rob's thoughts on it are. Maybe that's why he's not on the show. He just wants, you know, they want to get. He seems to always avoid these Kinahan shows. I see a trend there. The, I mean, especially in the beginning, he did. Uh, he, he explicitly avoided those shows. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goddamn. Moving on. Fury Joshua, one of the fights Kinahan is obviously uh, a part of, a massive part of, by the way. Uh, it's apparently sort of been stagnating in terms of negotiations due to why? Whose name is first? Gary, thoughts? This is the kind of petty stuff that holds up fights, I right? Love, I love this. This is amazing. It, it, this is like when Mayweather, Mayweather wanted the fight with De La Hoya. He made every concession to make the fight. Someone's going to have to concede this. Like, I don't... Ego destroys everything, and it will destroy this fight. If someone doesn't say, okay, whatever... I'll win this fight, and then my name will be first for every fight I'm ever in for the rest of my life, for the rest of history. I'll be the undisputed heavyweight champion, and my name will always go first. So, whatever. I'll put my name second. Just make sure the, 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 the check is good. Whatever. I don't care. Just make the fight. But you're going to get two 
stubborn people who are egomaniacs who will, will let this ridiculousness stand in the way. My thing is, like, we've all been calling him Fury Joshua for a while now. Like, <laughs> if I'm Adrian, I just bite the bullet, man. Because, like, the public has already, like, spoken on what it is. You know what I mean? Like, you can't fight that current. I wish Rob was here. We call it Fury AJ. Is it called AJ Fury over there? Ooh, good question. You guys, people in the chat, let us know. Like, colloquially, like, if you're talking to a casual, right, do they say AJ Fury or Joshua Fury, or do they say Fury um, AJ? Like, I'm, I am curious about that. Uh, like, even Scott Brown says AJ Fury, who I believe is from the UK. I believe Scott Brown's from the UK. Um, so, like, maybe, maybe it is a bigger issue there than it is, like, stateside in terms of like what we see on headlines and media and, and how we talk about it uh on boxing youtube um matthew de is saying both psk is saying a bit of both yuda who's from india not the uk but obviously you know commonwealth i believe technically commonwealth i s still believe uh saying aj fury is more common adrian is saying aj fury wow maybe it is more of an issue how's an issue who cares how's it i Okay. No, no, it's in, like, no, no. In terms of branding, let's say, like, in terms of business, think about business side here, right? If you're the uh, the promoters, the networks, you're you're thinking of posters, marketing. Like, let's get rid of the ego for a second. Maybe it's not just the ego thing. Maybe it is a branding issue they're they're trying to figure out, which is a possibility. Like, how can we make the most money? If 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 it's Fury AJ, we're going to make the extra two million more than you know Joshua versus Fury. Like, that is possibly an issue. Maybe it's not a big issue, but I can see it being an issue. What, Gary, you're acting like branding and marketing no, isn't You're right. I'm just saying that this is the nonsense that holds up fights. Like, I, I'm agreeing with you. Okay, yes. I'm agreeing with you. But this is – it's complete nonsense. Like, Ter like, Terrence Crawford wouldn't let this hold up a fight with Spence. If his money was right and it was there, he would say, fine, put Spence's name first. I don't really care. What, what he – I think so. As long as the money is right, as long as he's not getting B side money, I think so. But he wants A side money. That's what I'm saying. Is this is this fight a 50 50 split? It's got to be, right? It has. Yeah. It has. If, and I'm not saying Crawford deserves a 50 50 fit split with Spence. He doesn't. Okay. But if he got a 50 50 split, I don't think Crawford would care if he put his name first or second. Uh, okay. You're in, in that thought experiment. Yes. Oh, yes. I think you're probably right. Okay. I just don't think it would be a 50-50 split. For he doesn't deserve it. I mean, Fury deserves 50-50. Crawford, I kind of think AJ's the A-side. Like, he kind of is. Like, Fury's the, the lineal champ. He beat Wilder. But, like, I feel like AJ, and I say uh, Fury AJ, too, right? So I make Fury the A-side. But I kind of feel like AJ kind of should be the A-side. Fury had the more transcendental moment than either one of them. That's the reality with the, yeah. with the second Wilder fight. Like, that, that was a, a fight that was big in two countries, okay? Uh, the two biggest markets in boxing. AJ Klitschko, well, you know, semi-decent, you know, in terms of, like, attention here. It was a massive fight, predominantly just in the UK. And obviously, maybe, like, Germany, like, you know, Eastern Europe, places that are really the hotbed for Klitschko mania back in the mid-2000s, of course. Um, but I think, largely speaking, Fury has peaked higher with that Wilder win than AJ has. Um, but uh, that's part of the stuff that they're negotiating, arguing about between lawyers as we speak. So, like you said, Gary, this is the bullshit that stops like big fights from happening. It's little tiny shit like this. Um, moving on. Uh, where are we at? Speaking of big fights, Pacquiao Ryan Garcia is still in this limbo of, I have no idea if it's going to happen. We're getting conflicting messaging here. Uh, Eddie Renesso, obviously the trainer of Ryan Garcia, uh, does not want the fight to happen. Wants Tank Davis instead. Tank Davis is injured, though, so probably not going to happen, of course. We do have it, though, with Sean Gibbons, who's the president of Manny Pacquiao Promotions, uh, stating, stating that Ryan Garcia makes like the most sense for the fight. However, we also have Adi Atir, who's the manager of Pacquiao 
having that statement that came out what, like a week ago, I think that we forgot to talk about Gary of saying like, no one can talk about Pacquiao's future, but us, our management company, which I believe was a shot at Sean Gibbons. If I had to guess, right. I guess. Yeah. I mean, it was that who it was it's intended to be a shot at someone You're, I'm guessing it's Gibbons, right? Who else could it be? I'm guessing. Cause around that time, I think Sean Gibbons had another quote and headline out there about Pacquiao. Um, so that's just what it, it makes sense to me. So who knows what's happening here with Pacquiao, with Garcia, but any thoughts on, you know, the conflicting messaging we're getting from these yeah. negotiations, let's call it. So last week, Eric Gomez came out and said, we had a conversation with, with Pacquiao's team. It didn't really go anywhere. The fight's not going to happen. Immediately after that, Eric, uh, Ryan Garcia said it's going to happen. This 2021 is going to be, <laughs> it's going to be Pacquiao and then Tank Davis. <laughs> So, but I think, and, and, and I could be wrong, I don't know Ryan Garcia personally, when Chepo Reynoso came out and said, I don't like the fight for him, I, I, I think Ryan is an intelligent kid, I think he's got a good head on his shoulder, he sees where Canelo is, and he wants to get there, not that it's Reynoso's decision, but I think he'll listen to Reynoso, if Reynoso said this is not the right fight for you at the time, I don't think Ryan will take it. I don't know, man. I'm... I used to be like 70 30 that this fight was going to happen. Now I'm more like 55 45 this fight's going to happen. Oh, you still think it's going to happen? I still think it's a possibility. I, absolutely. I still, in my mind, it's the easiest money for Pacquiao. So it makes sense if you're Pacquiao. Um, Ryan Garcia is the one question mark where you're going in most likely thinking you're not going to come out winning this fight. Right. You have to go in kind of thinking that in some fashion. Well, Ryan Garcia doesn't think that Chepo might, which is why he doesn't want to take the play, but Ryan's not thinking that. No, no, no. I'm purely talking purely talking business now. Okay. Okay, okay. I see. Um, like if you're Oscar, if you're uh Ryan's management, like you're not really worried about getting the W. Like that that's not really what matters. Like, let's get your name in every mainstream headline we can we can possibly do. And the big biggest way we can do it, the easiest way we can do that is pack out. Um and Reynoso, of course, he's smart enough. He knows that Ryan's not going to win this fight. But he also isn't involved with the business as much. Like, he's going to make up, up money regardless because he has Canelo. Right? Like, Ryan's like the extra revenue stream for him, if you think about it that way. For, mo- for most trainers, Ryan Garcia would be a main revenue streamer. But he's a secondary revenue stream <laughs> for Eddie Reynoso. So he doesn't have to play the business as much with him. That's why he's probably thinking. No, this is a bad move. He's going to lose this fight. Like we can save him off for the lightweights, and that's far more feasible for him. Maybe he's not going to win them all, but he can win them. Like I, I, I don't see him winning the pack. That's probably what Eddie Renato was thinking. But again, he's not as concerned with the business because he's not reliant on Ryan Garcia. Who's reliant on Ryan Garcia? Oscar De La Hoya, who doesn't have Canelo anymore. So I, I think that we're going to have sort of a tug of war here. In some fashion, I think Ryan Garcia probably wants the fight. He's a young guy, has a big win under his belt now. He probably doesn't give a shit if he wins or loses. He wants to go in there and tries to fight a legend, right? Have the experience. Uh, his promoter wants it. His network probably wants it. The only one that doesn't want it is probably his trainer and maybe his team, like Canelo. Maybe his management doesn't want it, but I don't think they. W- I don't see why a manager wouldn't want your client to get the biggest possibility or biggest. Um, uh, money fight possible. Like any manager would do that. So, yeah, I still think it's possible, Gary. I still think it's a potentiality that we get Pacquiao, yeah, Ryan Garcia next six months. If Canelo wasn't on the Cinco de Mayo day, this would be on Cinco de Mayo. I don't think I don't think it'd be a question. It would be a fun Cinco de Mayo fight because that's Pacquiao fought so many times, and then he got Ryan Garcia. It's a fun fight on that day. That would be. Um, any other thoughts, Gary? On I don't think it's gonna happen. I, I think Kula Hedge will prevail and Ryan will listen to Chepo. Damn it, that's not what I'm about, man. I'm <laughs> chaos. Um, speaking of Cinco de Mayo, uh, Ryan, uh, not Ryan, um, uh, Jose Ramirez and Josh Taylor, their fight, which was supposed to be on Cinco de Mayo, is now being moved off, obviously, because of the Canelo announcement with Billy Joe Saunders. The fight is being planned now for May 22nd. On ESPN, Gary, thoughts on this date uh, shift for the fight? Fine, good. I'm looking forward to the fight. I mean, it makes sense. I mean, yeah. it does. 
It's a great fight. I mean, I don't know if it does it's if it's a ratings bonanza, but it should do a good rating. Should be solid. So you you don't want to um the night of another mega fight to take away from. So I'm good with it. It's just two extra weeks. It's not a big deal. Plus, I mean, we we have no idea when Crawford's back. Like this might be your biggest fight you can do in the first, you know, quarter or sorry, sorry, second quarter of the year, or first half of the year, right? So you probably want to save this for a night where you can have the most eyes possible on you. Uh, if you put on a Canelo night, you're not gonna get any attention. Like that's just the reality. Like it would do under a million views if it was on Cinco de Mayo. Right. It would be like putting a football game on yesterday against Super Bowl. How's that gonna do? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, probably like a college football game too. Like, how's that gonna do? Um. Anyways, moving on from that, a, a tidbit. Oh God, this is the next topic. Listening, to Gary here, have a new fan or fan be be a new fanboy for a fighter. I hate when Gary finds a new fighter that he stands. It's the worst. It's the worst thing. I don't even know what topic is, but I'm interested. Oh, come on, come on, J- Jazz of Dickens, <laughs> Kick Galahad. Purse bid won by MTK. Gary has, I mean, guys, I wish you guys could see the group chat sometimes. Other times, I'm absolutely happy you guys don't see the group chat. However, Gary waxing poetically about Jazz Dickens and how he beats everyone at featherweight, except for Gary Russell, uh, has just been, nause- I- has been nauseating, guys. I, I, Oh, my God. G- Galahad's going to... Dog walk Dickens, and I cannot wait to see this rematch just to prove Gary wrong, guys. You have no idea how bad it's been. Uh, th- that is grossly over exaggerating what I said about Jazz Dick. I said it beats Kid Galahad. Okay. Um, well, I think he's, I think he mentioned that he could knock out Josh Warrington right now. <laughs> but Warrington went to 130, right? So he's not even in the picture anymore. No, he's not uh, 130. Isn't he fighting at 130? No, wait, his next fight's at 130, but he's not staying at 130. That's, okay. Just, you know. that's just okay. He vacated uh, the book he's trying to get the Gary Russell fight, remember? That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. Uh, Dickens oh, is vastly. I should say, he was stripped of the belt because he was facing a nobody and then trying to get the Gary Russell fight and not his mandatory. That's why he right. was not vacated. Sorry. Um, That's kind of vacating, right? That's kind of, kind of like. You can't fire me, I quit, kind of thing, right? Like, um, yeah, look. a little bit like that. <laughs> Dickens is a much better fighter. He's a different fighter than the first fight. I went back and I watched the first fight, and then I watched Dickens' last two fight in the Golden Contract. He's uh, he's he's, he's a twitchier guy. He he's really good. Galahad is just a better version of what he was then, right? Same fighter, just sharper, right? Um. Uh, Galahad, I mean, Dickens' footwork is much better. He takes himself out of position to be countered, right? Like in the first fight with um, Galahad, he would come in wild and Dickens with him. He's not like that anymore. He's a much more disciplined fighter. He's twitching. He's good. He's hard to hit, but he would leave himself to be countered. Galahad had so much success with Warrington in a fight. I don't think he win, but we can disagree on that. That's fine. I can fight close. Fight was close either way. But Warrington's in front of him to be hit, and that's why Galahad hit him so much. If you go back and you watch Dickens' last two fight, he throws off his combination and he gets out of the way. He pivots to a place you can't hit him. Like Dickens is is one of the most improved fighters in the sport, and the first fight was close, right? Like it was a really competitive fight, and Dickens just fatigued late in the fight and he got stopped, right? But it was close to even on the scorecards at the time through ten rounds, and he had never been ten rounds, and he had never been twelve. I think it was eleventh round knockout. It was a tenth round knockout. But the point was, Dickens wasn't experienced enough at that time, and Galahad got rid of him. Gal- full credit to him. But you're not facing that same fighter. Where Galahad is the same fighter, he's just better. Dickens is a different fighter. Dickens, I, I don't know how you don't watch that Dickens fight in the last two fights against uh, Lee Woods and uh, Walsh. I said, that's not a vastly improved fighter. That's a really good fighter. I think he improved, but I mean, vastly improved? No. It's, it's, a different it's not a different fighter. It's not, man. This is still the same guy that lost to like Gamma Rigendale years ago. Like, what are you talking about? Okay, he lost to Rigendale. Okay, so what? He would lose to Rigendale today. So what? Like, Rigendale's a great. It's like he lost to Kick Outhead years ago and he would still lose to Kick Outhead. <laughs> no. I mean, look, maybe <laughs> I'm. He sucks he lost to Mayweather. Okay, he lost to Mayweather. Who cares? Like, okay. Like, he lost to Rigo. Okay, Rigo's great. 
no, it's not that he just lost them. It's like the wins against Lee Wood and Ryan Walsh aren't like the wins that Canelo got post Mayweather, right? right. I, I get it. Those are domestic level guys. Don't call them club level guys because Rob, <laughs> Rob's going to have a fit. Domestic level guys. I get it. But they're decent. You know, they're fine. Yeah. I mean, they're like beating Jason Velez. Yeah, sure. And you look really good against Jason Velez, then you're ready to. I don't think Galahad is as good as everyone thinks he is. Like, I thought he lost the fight to Warrington. I, 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 he's good. He was in a 50 50 fight with a, a inferior Jazz Dickens at the time, who's much, much, much better now. Uh, I think Kid Galahad, while a very boring fighter to watch, is one of the most skilled boxers, if not the most skilled boxer, now that, now that Shakur Stevenson is not in the division uh, at Featherweight. So I think Kid Galahad's going to beat Dickens. Probably a decision this time since Dickens has improved somewhat. But Kigal had, in my opinion, beat Josh Warrington. I thought he made him look silly. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, I I think Kigal is one of those people that can actually beat like Gary Russell on like any given night. Like that's a possibility. Um, so maybe I'm just hyperbolic in the other direction, right? Like you you're high on Dickens. I'm really high on Galahad, and that's why we differ on this fight so drastically. What about y'all in the UK? Because y- y- y'all got a better taste for this than us in the US. Is anyone agreeing with me that Dickens is much better and, and can win this fight? Will win this fight? Is anyone picking Jazz of Dickens to beat Kid Galahad? Please. Please let us know. I um, picked Jazz of Dickens on Twitter and he liked it and retweeted it. Because <laughs> we're the only person to talk about him that entire day. Of course he found that tweet. <laughs> it's not that hard, man. When you search your name and that's the only tweet that pops up. <laughs> PSK saying Gal had easy. Yeah. The first fight wasn't easy. Like I don't get I don't get the easy thing. I, the first fight was yes, he stopped him and he took care of business because Jazza Dickens faded because he wasn't ready for that kind of level for twelve rounds. Dude, I got Harper marks on my side, man. The better Stooge brothers. Like let's be let's be honest. Or three Stooges, I should say. Uh, stuck boxing. Dickens is too small for featherweight. I don't know if that's really the case. I just think that he's like not a world level guy. Like he's a domestic level fighter. That's a good domestic level fighter, and that's fine. See, I would. Dickens is too small for featherweight. Is Lee Wood too small for featherweight? No, he's a massive featherweight. And Dickens had no problems dictating the range, pushing him around the ring. Zaza Dickens is not too small for featherweight. No, I, I don't think that's the case. I don't. Um. Anyways, Gary, let's move on. Um, oh, by the way, the purse bid was like super low. It's 200. Chain 209 or something like that? $202,000. Um, That's whack. Not shocking, though. I guess not. I mean, it's not that big. Of, I mean, I'm into it. You're into it. But, like, it's not that big of a fight, really. No, I I, I would assume it's not even a big fight in the UK. Wow. Like, in comparison, right? What's so golden about that contract? That's more like the bronze contract. Like, eh, eh, eh. I'll be honest. I don't think I. I think I watched only like one of those cards. I love that. Go, the golden. I, I, I watched. I watched the Dickens fights because, like, I like the main events. There, like, one. I, I like Ryan Walsh. Like, I like Lee Woods. Like, I like those fights. Like, those were intriguing fights. But like, I never sat down and watched those entire cards. No. Especially since, like, after like we start talking about like Daniel Kinahan, I'm like, I'm not going to sit here and watch the entire cards of. Kinahan shit. No, fuck that. Um, but anyways, yeah, Galahad's gonna win easy this time. Knockout, six rounds. Okay. You really think that? Six round knockout. I mean, he has a decent knockout ratio. Okay. You're taking him to knock him out by in six rounds. Six rounds. Within let's say ten rounds. I'll take Jazz on points. Okay. Okay. I cannot rate to be right. You have a date for this fight. There's no date, right? No, 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 no. It, it just the first bid um, got done with. So now they're going to negotiate. Gonna get, as we get closer to this fight, this is going to get ugly between us. Because Rob's with you, right? Rob's a big Galahad fan. I don't know if he's a big Galahad fan. I, he's, not really like, he's not like me. Like I'm a Galahad fan. Okay. But he definitely thinks that Galahad beats Dickens. And then Fugati, because Rob thinks that. Rob, Fu's going to think that too. Who? <laughs> Who the fuck is this? Is this? Who got you to... <laughs> but we um, just come back anytime. Yeah. 
<laughs> uh, speaking um, of the low weight classes, and we're talking about the lightweight division earlier, Tifa Lopez, George Cambosis, purse bid, February 11th to 10th, right? I think it's the I think it's the 11th. It's yeah, which is a couple days. Um, Bob Aram saying that these guys want too much money, which <laughs> I have to think it's just the Lopez that wants too much money because <laughs> he's the only one out there talking about ten million dollars. <laughs> <You know? laughs> okay, so <laughs> only Lopez. Um, and it's gonna be interesting to see Bob Aram somehow use purse bids on his own fighters. That's an in-house fight, right? It's an in-house fight. And somehow use this to undervalue his own fighters who are under contract with him. It's gonna be crazy to watch this happen, Gary. Because that's what's happening, right? Like he does he doesn't want to pay them what he has <laughs> contracted them with, right? Because <laughs> they're his fucking fighters. So he's using the purse bid to undermine their value and pay them less than what they're contractually owed. That's what I'm assuming is happening here, right? What are the odds that Eddie or Al or someone comes in and buys this, snatches this up? No. no. Billionaire on Australia is like, you know what? I want this fight. I'm going to buy it. You might get a billionaire in Australia. Because, like, Australia is weird with boxing, man. Like, it's a, it's a, it's a market that I, re- re- like, really don't know much about. And there's always rumors of, like, billionaires that just, like, fund everything. So, maybe. That's a possibility, Gary, I guess. But I don't think Eddie Hearn or Oscar or Al Heyman can come in here and you know, put a purse bid down for Lopez. <laughs> Can't post this. I mean, they're going to get paid a lot less than what they're owed, and it's really sad. Fighters, this is a good sign right here. You all need to be working much more in tandem than you think, okay? Because promoters were literally used the system to undermine what they have signed up with you. That's ridiculous. Do you think that... I, I can't see. I don't know. Again, I don't know what negotiations were. I don't know what they offered um, each fighter, but they just signed um, TFE to a contract where his, his base pay was $5 million, right? Like, I, heard. I, I can't see him getting more than that at um, <laughs> a purse bid. I can't see him getting half that. So why, <laughs> I'll take the $5 million and we're good. Like, like, there's nothing else to talk about. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'll take the $5 million. We're good. What if Bob Aram was just like stonewalling the negotiation that's an in-house negotiation just to undermine that value? I guess. I mean, I this guy... <laughs> you. Like, think, think about it. If you're Bob Aram, you're in the hole now. Like, big time. $5 million for Team Fernando Lopez. That dude doesn't even have 100,000 Twitter followers. And you're paying him $10 million or $5 million at least? Uh, ah. Look. It's boxing. Like we just got through a story with the mob in boxing in 2021, okay? 2021, and Bob Aram is from the 50s, guys. He's from the era of Frankie Carbo, for fuck's sake. <laughs> <It's insane. laughs> like, I am full on conspiracy here with the, these purse bids. I think per, I think Bob Aram is fucking tanking the value of his fighters, or this fight, I should say, because he cannot pay what he is owed to them. Well, we would have a client who's account who who's bitching about his his account, right? And you're like, this stock is down twenty percent. It's not a loss until you sell it. Right? Like, I feel like if you could just delight, like this stock's at fifty percent. This one's down twenty. It's not a loss until you sell it. Don't like it's a great time to buy more. You want to buy more? Look, look, how it is. Let's buy more. It's still going to what I told you it was going to. Let's buy more now, right? I feel like that's a, he's like okay. Look, it's not a loss until I sell. Maybe I can get him to leave this contract. I can just push it back so like I can get TFP to walk out, and I don't need to pay him anything. It's not a loss at all. It's not a loss until you sell. I'll get him to walk away from the contract if I'm not ever letting him fight. There's no way that contract's real, right? <laughs> I don't know. It's so like, outrageous. Like, there's no way that Lopez contract. Is, is is structured in the way that he's claiming it is. I, I just maybe if it was like peak 2018 and that boom that we had a couple years ago, right? Maybe then, but it's still maybe even then. Nowadays, after kind of the bubble burst a little bit because of COVID and the whole pandemic, I don't know, man. Like I, there's, there's a big part of me that doesn't really believe that contract entirely as well. And if you're Terrence Crawford, oh, you're, and, you're, you're and Terrence Crawford. is like me. I agree to what I agree to. But you're bitching about me losing you money. Look what you just gave to Tiafimo Lopez. 
Like, you're saying I lost, you could buy a house in Malibu on what you lost on me? Look what you just gave him, and he's done nothing. He's headlined two fights. Only one of them's done a good number. None of them has done what I do. Are you kidding me? Like, if I was Tyrus Crawford, my head would explode right now. Shout out to Top Rank, man. Just a well oiled <laughs> machine over there, man. Anyways, moving on. Um, where are we at? Uh, oh, here we go. Demetrius Andrade. Oh, shit. I accidentally pressed the wrong button. Here we go. Demetrius Andrade, uh, Liam Williams, per spit, scheduled for February 10th. First Boxing Board of Control headquarters in Cardiff. Um, so, Gary, looks like your boy Andrade not getting the Triple G fight. He's not getting the Canelo fight either. Not getting any fight. I mean, that's like this is not a fight. terrible fight, right? No, it's not. No, honestly, this is probably his best fight ever. <laughs> I mean, you can make the argument a little bit. Like Liam Williams is not a a, a scrub in any fashion. I thought he was robbed in the uh, was it the, was it the first William Smith fight. I'm trying to remember the fight now. Um, been a while now. And Andrade, he hasn't had a significant win since Vandesmata Rosen. I mean, other than Siliski, who uh, is all uh, right, I guess. Walter. Walter White from Breaking Bad. Yeah. Dude, you can't beat up Brian Cranston. The dude's like 70 years old. What the fuck's the matter with you, Demetrius? Got in the ring. Shouldn't have gotten the ring. <laughs> <laughs> Um, did no, you see what Rob just said? No, <laughs> was it text? Can I read it? Yeah, Aaron <laughs> said, All I'm saying is, Team Female Camp Boxes is one of the marquee great fights that are going to be shown this spring. No, 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 you, you messed up. You messed up, and it's you, a key mess up you had there. All I'm saying is, Team Female Camp Boxes is not oh. one of the marquee great fights that are going to be shown this spring or this summer. Uh, Aaron told BoxingScene.com on Monday. It's not a marquee fight. It is what it is. And let's see how it all works out. Dude, I okay. told you. <laughs> He's right about that. I mean, he is right. It's not one of the marquee fights. That's absolutely true. But when you're allegedly owed, your minimum is $5 million. Every fight now has to be a marquee fight. Like, that's the reality now. Especially when, like, your name itself is not making it a marquee fight. Right, like Canelo's name alone makes fights marquee fights. Pacquiao does that, Mirror does that, Oscar did that, right? But in this equation, we don't have that here. So it's concerning. Like, I don't know what happens here. Like, and again, I think this is all being used to undermine what is in the contract, and that's like Predatory, right there, in my opinion. Um, moving on from that, yeah, Gary can't mess up that keyword. They're not. <laughs> I, yeah, I totally do. Which is why I was like, no, now it's more sad. Yeah. Um. But anyways, Andrade Williams. Yeah, I like the fight. It's a good fight. Yeah, there's not much to say about it. Uh, moving on, guys. We're going to, have to sort of blitz through these news topics and then get to fights. Unfortunately, I apologize. Uh, Franco Maloney three. Is being looked at. So is Elwin Soto versus Felix Alvarado unification. I really love that Soto Alvarado fight. I'll be honest, Gary. Like I know the same card. We're great, even if they're not on the same card, right? Like I really love the Soto uh, Alvarado fight more than the Franco Maloney fight. I'll be honest. I know you're a uh, Franco fan. I I understand that, but Soto Alvarado is gonna be a bloodbath. Like it's gonna be a violent violent fight. I cannot wait. Totally uh, engaged with that one. Uh, and obviously, Franco Maloney 3 is a worthwhile fight, too. Like I think there needs to be some finale with that, of course, especially what happened in the second fight um, due to the alleged headbutt. Um, moving on, though. Gary, any thoughts on that? No? You good? I think it's put on one card. That's all I'm saying. It's a great card. Gary Russell Jr. saying uh, Eddie Hearn offered him $1 million to fight Josh Warrington. Beneath my standards is what he said. Um, is it? I don't know. Like, well, this is a negotiation. Okay, so he asked for two and a half. That's, yeah. 
I, I do people not know how negotiations work? I, I, no, right. no, they don't. No, they don't. Is that a ridiculous offer? Of one million for a featherweight? Like it doesn't seem that bad to me. Like it's probably low, so you come back high and see where you can meet. I mean, they'd both probably both get paid what, like one point something million. Five? Yeah, I think yeah. one five is a, a, a great fine. Yeah, that's probably what I would like pay them. You know, in terms of the market standard. Um, Lewis Neary has parted ways with Eddie Reynoso, uh, and I. It's hard to say because I saw some of the translated quotes, and. I don't want to really speak to like the tone of this breakup because it's hard to to read again through a translated quote that came off a little bit odd. Uh, also, just to just round up the topics, Jamal James has been elevated to WBA uh, regular champion in order to face Butiev next. Also, Floyd Mayweather, Logan Paul exhibition to fight that Gary's been so hyped for. Uh, hasn't pushed back again. Uh, and another exhibition, I know Gary loves these exhibitions, Lamar Odom has fined, has signed a uh, fight deal. I know Gary's hyped for that. He's fighting uh, Aaron Carter, who's like uh, some dude. Lamar Odom had game. Like, L- Lamar Odom was a problem for anybody. In basketball. I don't, uh, boxing, I, mean, I have no idea. Yeah, no idea. Gary, any thoughts on the news? You want to get to fights? Fights. Okay, obviously, fights this weekend. We have on the zone Joseph Diaz versus Rakimov, which should be a really fun fight. Rakimov is one of those prospects who a lot of people have been hyped on, obviously now getting a huge step up. And Patrick Teixeira versus Brian Carlos Castano in the co-main event. And probably going to be the like all-violence fight of the weekend, if I had to pick. If it's, it's either this or the Richard Comey fight. For like the fights that are going to produce the most violence for us, um, and what's else in the card? Hold on, because Boxer doesn't have out to pull up ESPN. Uh, other fights on the card are Ronnie Rios versus Oscar Negret, good fight in my opinion. Jason Quigley versus Shane Mosley Jr. Melakuzia versus the dreaded TBA, uh, and some other people that I don't know. Gary, your thoughts on the DAZN card? <laughs> It's uh, five days out from the fight. If you have to fight Melikuziev on this short of notice, I feel bad for that guy. Okay. <laughs> um, that's a really fun card. It's a good card. From top to bottom, it's good. Um, Rakimov is kind of like in the position where Jojo Diaz was when he fought Gary Russell. Like He's probably not going to win, but let's see how competitive it is. Let's see how good he looks. Um, because Jojo Diaz wasn't going to beat Gary Russell, but he looked good in it, and he and he showed well for himself, and that really helped him out. Um, then the the, the real fight of the night is Castano and Tishar. Castano is criminally underrated. He might be the best guy at 154. Now, like 154 is a division where everyone beats everyone, so I'm not saying he's going to run through all of them. He is offensively so good. He's got a left hook to the body that's like Miguel Cotto when he fires off his jab, like he's a rhythm fighter right like when things are going well he's so good like and you saw that when things weren't going so well in the lower fight like his jab just became like a poor but when it's all going he's as good offensively so look to Sarah's not defensively Arslan de Laura so I don't see him making him miss that much like Laura could uh, and I thought he, he probably won the I thought a draw was fair but if you had to say you have to give to someone Cassano probably won that fight um although a draw was completely reasonable um, Teixeira's not going to make a miss and, and frustrate him. So I think Teixeira stands up and we have lots of high-octane offense, but Castano is such a force offensively. He's so physically strong and powerful. Like, he's just working with volume, but with, like, one-punch power. He's so offensively good. I think he gets Teixeira out in 9 or 10. Like, eventually breaks him down and gets him out. Castano beat Errol Spence in the amateurs and... um. Um, what's the uh, middleweight's name? A uh, Derevchenko. Mm-hmm. Like, so the kid's got boxing skills. He's not just a pressure forward bull. Like, he's got skills. No, he should win this fight. Um, and, and I think it really comes down to this. Um, though I, I, I let me correct one thing. He beat Derevchenko in the World Series of Boxing. Not, I don't know. If that's the honor. whatever you want to call that. They're they're, they're semi fights, semi pro fights, right? There. I think that's the the term that we've been using. Um. Castano should win this fight, and I agree with basically everything you're saying. I just want to add to it. Um, Castano and Teixeira are both 
dynamic, offensive, violent fighters, but in different ways. Castano is far more of a compact boxer puncher, while Teixeira is that more of a lanky, swarmer, and he plays with range in very subtle ways. When Castano tries to ignore range or get through the range and get to you, Teixeira can play in that mid-range in a way that Castano can't, and that that is interesting. Like I, I am curious if like if this fight's kept at range in some fashion. Teixeira is going to have the advantage because he fights better at range. Like he his the way his body moves, the way his punches, and just his overall technique is it adapts itself more to that mid range fight and that fire fight. However, because of the way he fights and that sort of sort of weird style that he has, uh, he has leaky defense. Like he's not he doesn't have compact. Uh, guard in any way to block shots, to parry shots. He's open to a lot of shit. So Castano, if he gets in consistently, should be able to batter up Teixeira on the inside and kind of own that range in some fashion. Um, so I'm picking Castano. I, I don't know if it should be a finish. I'm leaning towards a late fight finish, kind of like Gary, but it could go the full 12. Regardless, it's going to be an, an amazing fight. Like It's going to be a fight of the year contender, in my opinion. If it doesn't, it's probably because it ends too quick. Like it's probably because Castano catches Teixeira or something like that too quick, or vice versa, maybe. Um, it, it's it will be a factor of the fight not having enough violence in terms of just amount of time for the reason why it's not a fight of the year contender. But if this goes past four or six rounds, the amount of violence we're gonna get is gonna be just magnifico. Um, Gary, any other thoughts on this card? Um no, no. Uh, we yeah, we ran down everything in that. I know you got a time thing, so I'll try to keep it pretty quick. Oh, thank you, Gary. I appreciate that. Um, Joe Smith Jr., one of Gary's other boys, one of his other guys, uh, fighting Maxim Vlasov on the card. Uh, also, Adam Lopez versus Jason Sanchez, Richard Comey versus Jackson Marinas, Carlos and Damas versus the dreaded TBA, uh, Jared Anderson versus Kingsley Abe, um, and some other people. Jaya Tucker on the card. He's he's a prospect people have been looking at. That's about it for people that I am aware of. Gary, your thoughts on Joe Smith Jr. in this little four man light heavyweight tournament? All right, first, real quick, um, we talked about Carlos Adames, and I said I can't even believe he's a Robert Garcia fighter. Like I always forget because he doesn't throw a jab. And you said he probably only goes down there for a week or two before the fight. I said all right, maybe. I saw his Facebook page, and he was down in uh. The, the Robert Garcia boxing fight on me weeks ago, weeks ago, which means he did his whole camp here. If he doesn't throw a jab, Robert Garcia's got to get rid of him. Get, get out. <laughs> um, I still can't believe that Robert Garcia trains that guy. Like, does he fight anything like a Robert Garcia fighter? Yeah, a little bit. He doesn't throw a jab. Yeah, he throws a little jab. He doesn't work off the jab enough like a Robert Garcia fighter. That's the issue. Like, he jabs. He doesn't work off off of it like he should. Call the Thomas needs to throw a jab more. Um, I didn't say... Okay. I don't think it's an issue of throwing the jab more. It's about utilizing the jab. You can throw a thousand jabs in a fight, but if you don't use the jab like the tool it's meant to be used for, then it doesn't matter. That's the issue. Adamus no, doesn't, doesn't no. use his jab to work off shots and then to get on the inside to work his combination of the body. Nothing is great Hector or Mike, you can see where everything is straight down the pipe. Like it's like Arthur Abraham. Everything's wide with them. It's like Pascal's. Like, can you throw anything straight? Arthur Abraham was the worst. He never threw a straight punch. Um I never got <laughs> Pascal's a fine combination. I mean, a fine comparison, I, I would say. It's not a the greatest comparison. It's not in my opinion. Thomas is far more upright, far more static with his movement. Uh right. it's far more dynamic with his movement. Um Arthur Abraham, though, come on, that's just rude. I don't think it's that wrong. <laughs> I, 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 I think it's honestly, Abraham right. had Abraham had pop. Abraham beat Jermaine Taylor. Well, of course, I mean uh, Abraham had better wind at this point than Adamus. I'm talking about fighting style. Like Adamus is a better fighter. He's, he's a more complete fighter than Arthur Abraham. I, this is that he just doesn't work to his strengths like he should. And I think, honestly, it's not that the jab is his biggest weakness. I think it's his lack of head movement. Like, even if you're a, a fighter that stands kind of upright like he does and kind of static like he is, because he's, he's not a guy that's, like, moving and, you know, shifting a lot. 
you can still shift a little bit. You can still get off the center line a little bit and, and slip shots and work off of that with your combinations. He just doesn't do that. He tries to absorb punishment. Like that to me is the biggest issue. That's how he lost his fight with uh, Teixeira, right? That's where he lost it, right? Like that, and that's I mean his first fight since that loss too. Um, it's because he just wasn't getting out of the way. It wasn't because his offense wasn't working because his offense was working in that fight. He was just getting caught way too much on the return. You want to get to the main event? Uh oh, hold on, hold on. Before we get to that, okay, Richard Comey and his comeback. Okay. Okay. Versus Jackson Marina. Jackson Marina is uh, losing a very contentious decision with Roley Romero uh, fighting Richard Comey, who's coming off of a massive knockout loss to Tifa Lopez. I'm intrigued by this fight. I think Jackson Marina is one of the most underrated fighters in this division in some fashion. Uh, I think Richard Comey is one of the best top five fighters uh, that we have right now that's not really in that mix that we talk about. Um, so him being a benchmark to all these young fighters is what he should be in some fashion. And I'm absolutely intrigued by both guys off of the sort of comeback that they both have to do. Um, I'm picking Richard Comey just off of experience factor alone, but Jax Marinas is absolutely uh, a top-notch prospect. He's better than Hector Tenohara. I mean, it's just it's silly. So silly. <laughs> um, no, it's a good fight. It's a good test. Like, um, it, it's a chance that Comey has to pass if he wanted wants to be back, right? Like, if he wants to be relevant again, you got to be, you got you got to win this fight. Um, and, and for Jackson Marina, it's, it's it's a great fight. You get a win over over um, Richard Comey. You have a better win than um, uh, Devin Haney. Like, you have a good, you have a better win than Tanahara. Right, even after Tanahara beats uh, Mikado in Puerto Rico, you still have a better win than him. No, I mean, if you if he wins this fight, he's getting a talent shot very quick, like yeah. very soon. Like he's fighting Tifa Lopez this year if he beats Richard Comey. And that's a big game. I'm not saying he's going to because I think it depends a lot on how much of Comey was knocked out of him in that Lopez fight. You know, because that was brutal, and he's not young anymore, and he's defensively bad. Right, so it's like, did it, it has something now been exposed where? You could knock him out now, right? Has TFMO because TFMO got rid of him in like two rounds. That yeah, was quick. It's it, it, something exposed now. Where it's like, okay, here's the blueprint to beat Comey, even though he's a physical force offensively. Yeah, I, I, I'm really intrigued by that one. Now, the main event, obviously, Joe Smith Jr. versus Maxim Vlasov. Maxim Vlasov has been a guy that's been around for some time. Uh, he's a veteran in the sport. Joe Smith Jr. also, at this point now, a veteran in the sport. But Joe Smith Jr. is probably like, the one guy that might be a better beeve or a bivol in a rematch, I should say. Um, because everyone else at this division, I don't think really have it, even like Gilberto Ramirez. Like, I don't think he beats better beeve or bivol, but Joe Smith Jr., he is tough enough, he is gritty enough, and a plus, he has polished his game enough. He's not going to be, you know, the next Floyd Mayweather, right, or the next Roy Jones Jr. But he has definitely chipped away at the excess of his game, has fine-tuned his technique to become a better boxer puncher. So mm -hmm. I'm really intrigued at how good Joseph Jr. looks as he's going to win this fight, in my opinion. It's just a matter of how like dominant he is. I think he's probably going to beat up Vlasov off in this fight. Uh, and then get a big fight after this, whether it's better beef or Bivol in a rematch. It doesn't matter. Uh, but I'm excited to see Joseph Jr. get that chance again. Um, absolutely, and like I can't believe Joe Smith Jr. is about to be a world champion. Like we, like he's come so far, right, from just being a guy who's fun to watch, who's, who's going to lose all of his big fights, to being on the verge of being a world champion. I remember before he fought Jesse Hart, I was talking to um Joe DeGuardia, and I said, "Your boy's going to win." And I don't think Joe DeGuardia was convinced he was going to beat Jesse Hart. Like I really don't. Um, and he beat him easily. I, I know one judge had it for a Jesse Hart, but that was outrageous, right? Um, like, he's come so far. And Vlasov, boy, I hope Vlasov doesn't win this fight because he's been a guy who's been close. Right? All his losses, he lost to Slumber early in his career, close, and then beat him close. He lost to Gilberto Ramirez, close, and then he went up to Cruiserweight and lost to Glacky, right? I guess. Yeah, he was a good fighter. Really good yeah. fighter. And he's, I mean, 
175 to 200 is not a weight jump you should make if you can't, right? And he comes back to 175, which means that he should have been fighting at 175 the whole time. Um, but he's been close with these fights, right? Like, he's been close in these other fights. Is this the fight that he finally gets close enough and wins? I hope not, because it's my boy Joe Smith Jr. I really want Joe Smith to get this world title. Yeah, I don't think he's going to win this fight. I mean, Vlasov, like you said, he's been close a few times, but he's one of those guys that doesn't have any spark to anything, right? Like, there's nothing that he does particularly great. And Joe Smith Jr., he has great durability. He has really above average to great power for the division. And just his overall style, his, his volume, his, his pressure, like, that is some of the best pressure in the division, period. Like, the only person that has better pressure than Joe Smith Jr. is Arthur Betterbeef. That's it. Like, no one else in the division has better pressure than him, period. Um, so, that's going to win him uh, quite a few fights. Uh, and I do wonder, like, in a rematch with Bivol, like, is he able to get around that jab? You know, that was the thing that lost him that fight. I'm very curious how he gets around that. Uh, moving on, though. What, Gary? Bivol needs to get in the ring. I don't understand what they're doing over there at... Um, um, Top ring? Kathy Duver. Um um. What? Yeah. I, I'm sorry. Uh, he's he's got the TV deal with the zone, but then it's Kathy Duva. What, what is Kathy Duva's promotion's name again? Um, he's not with Kathy Duva anymore. All right. He's this, got a couple. Uh, Bivol oh, isn't. Oh, sorry. I thought you were talking about Joe Smith. That's why. Oh, I was well, with... No, Joe Smith is with the oh, Guardian. No, no, no I, I'm 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 back on what you're talking about now. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm like Joe, Joe Smith is not with Kathy Duva. Um. No. Yeah. I think he he. Main event. He's with main uh, event. Uh, yeah. He had he had a co-promotional deal with Matchroom. Was right? it what, Matchroom or was it just the zone? Was it Matchroom? I believe he had a co-promotional deal. You're with right. Matchroom. You're right. Because when he fought up, when I went to his fight, Eddie Hearn was there and everything. It was yeah. You're right. It, it was. Might, it might have been a fight by fight deal with Matchroom. That was po- that could be possible. Um, but I don't know what's happening with him now. It's been a while. Two years since that Joe Smith fight, and the only guy he fought was the. Uh, I guess it was mandatory or whatever. It was, on, it was on the undercard of the Usyk. He fought, um, I can't even think of it. Lenny Castillo? Yeah. Yep. yep. Like, that's, that's not even a real opponent. And that guy was game. He was tough. But, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, that's not a good level of competition. You know, like, everyone, like, wanted him to fight Canelo? Like, no one talks about that anymore. Because he doesn't fight anyone anymore. He's become Gary Russell Jr. He just doesn't fight. It's sad. I'm really sad. I don't know if it's a promoter issue or management issue. Main event has nothing else. I mean, I know they have Sunday, but he's in jail and stuff. So like, let's uh, put Kovalev to the side. This is what they have. Like, he's priority A, B, C, one, two, and three. Yeah, but if you have no TV dates, it doesn't matter if he's a priority for you. Get on the phone then. Get on the phone with with everyone else. Like, I got Baval. He's a champ. That's why, that's why I'm assuming it's not a promoter issue. Yeah, it must, I mean, be, it must be a management issue. Luther Bell said he couldn't get a phone call for Regis. Like, I can't get a phone call. No one will answer me. Like, no one wants to. All right. Shit happens, man, unfortunately. Um, anyways, moving on from that card, last card of the weekend. Josh Warrington versus Mauricio Laura. Zelfa Barrett versus Kiko Martinez. Dalton Smith versus uh, Ishmael Ellis. And Lee Wood versus Reese Mould. Or Mould. Um, Gary, any thoughts on this UK Frank Warren card? The or, sorry, Zelda, card. Sorry, matchroom card. The Zelpa Barrett versus Kiko Martinez fight's a good test for Zelpa Barrett. Right? Like that's a name. Kiko Martinez is a name that we always use. It's like, oh, you should fight Kiko Martinez, right? Like there's a former champion somehow. Go beat him, right? And then like work your way up from there. Um, the Josh Warrington fight, it should be one way traffic, right? Like the only question is Warrington get him out and get his fifth knockout and 50 fights or whatever it is. Um, that, and Dalton Smith is not as good a 140 prospect as Omar Warriors, which we know. Um, Omar Warriors would dog walk him and knock him out in probably two rounds. Hey, but maybe uh, he improved, man. That's possible. He does try to be like a Toro Gatti. He's got the neck tattoo. He wears the white trunk with the blue stripe. He kind of throws up his combinations like him. Obviously, whoever taught him, I think it was his dad, was a big Gaddy fan since you fight like Gaddy. So I respect that. And then what was the other name on that? Uh, Lee Ward versus uh, Reese Mold. Mold. That doesn't do anything for me. What? 
Okay, that's the best fight on the card. I can't wait for that fight. I mean, Lee Wood is a guy that almost beat your boy Jazza Dickens, for fuck's sake. Who's he fighting? Reese Mold is undefeated uh, UK guy. He's undefeated like a regional guy. You didn't know that guy. Is he good? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. It's undefeated fire, though. I'm curious. You know, maybe he's some guy I'll be like I've never seen before, or maybe I have seen before. He comes out here and blows out Lee Wood, a guy who, who I know. Like I've seen Lee Wood fight quite a few times, so you know that's why. I, I, like Ivan Price, I think I vaguely remember seeing Ibrahim uh, Nadim. I've never seen before. I, I want to say so. That's it for that card. Gary, any other thoughts, man? Um, is that all? have we got through everything in an hour and twenty minutes? Dude, we did. I'm so wow. happy because I've been in the two hours. So I just kind of steamrolled two through things. Look at us be like efficient. Yeah, yeah. Um, I just said let's do another show because we can't get through all the topics because we talk too much. But we did it in record time. You know why? We had, we had no fights this last weekend. Yeah, that's another like 20, 30 minutes right there. If we had fights this last weekend, that's the reality. Um, but anyways, uh, guys, uh, I will be recording. I won't be live. I'll be recording in about 40 minutes with the guys over at Walkout Network. Anthony Walker, Jay Petri, and Benjamin Duffy talking about all things UFC 259. I think it's the number. Yeah, UFC 259. Kamar Usman versus Gilbert Burns. That comes out tomorrow morning on the Walkout Network on YouTube. So check that out tomorrow morning. And also tomorrow at 2 p.m. Uh, Pacific Standard Time, our usual time, I'll be on the Cold James Cash Show breaking down all things Dino Kinahan, uh, and you know the mob and boxing, also uh, history uh, in the sort of socialism and uh, communism ideology. Um, so that should be a fun show as well. I will link those on our YouTube page, of course, when they come out. Um, anything else I can think of for housekeeping? General Strike Podcast. I want to get one this week. So Friday or Thursday is the plan, whichever day I'm the most free. Friday is probably what's going to be, Friday night. If I had to guess, that's probably where I'm going to be the most free. So General Strike Podcast on Trending Now Network if you want to see more of my uh, political takes and commentary. And obviously, a bunch of fights this weekend. Me and Gary will be back on this weekend, probably Monday. So actually, after the weekend, I should say. Um, after Valentine's Day. So Monday, uh, we will have a good show breaking down all these epic fights and any other news that comes out in the boxing world. Um, that's about it. Find me, Matt Hunter, MCR, all social media platforms, the like button, share the show, subscribe, patreon.com forward slash trending now network and cash app trending now network. If you want to support the channel in any financial way, Gary, final thoughts. Uh, find me all from the social media, uh, 3d boxing, 3d boxing blog. It was good to be back. We finally got a good week of boxing. It is February 8th, 2021. The iron boy. Ivan Calderon is still not in the Boxing Hall of Fame. We need to make that change. Um, if you're in Texas, contact your local representative and have him support House Bill 1359 uh, to make Texas a country again. From Texas to the world, thank you and God bless. Remember, guys, at all times, fuck the police, abolish the state, and free Palestine. Have a good one. Peace.